It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, you're such a lovely audience and I'm, I've had the pleasure of meeting most of you in person. And two is because probably my parents are watching this right now and they've been wondering for so long what on earth have I been doing in Hungary for all these years. So it is time that they actually know. We're talking today about HIV. The story started about a century ago. This is where a simian virus, a virus that was only infecting primates, such as monkeys, were infecting the chimpanzees somewhere in Africa. Now, when multiple types of the simian virus have infected the chimpanzee monkey, recombination happened. And this means that there was an exchange between genetic material between the viruses. And out of this recombination, a new virus was born, and that was able to cross infect other species, such as humans. This was, of course, the HIV-1 that causes the devastating disease that we know as AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Around that time, the recombination of the simian viruses in another type of monkey, which is called the Mangabe monkey, present in Western Africa and uh, some parts of Central Africa, has resulted in the evolvement of the HIV type 2 that I'm quite sure that not many of you know. So hence, it's going to be my topic. There's a great difference between the two viruses. Yes, they have evolved from the same ancestor, which is a simian virus. However, we know that there's a great genetic difference between the two viruses. There are about 40 to 60 percent difference in the genetic sequence between the two viruses. This has resulted in genes being present in one and not the other. The difference in the genetic sequence has led to variability in the clinical spectrum between the two viruses. While HIV-1 is regarded as the most aggressive type of the two viruses, it tends to cause AIDS, which is the disease, much, much faster than HIV-2. If you're infected by HIV-1, you will develop AIDS within 5 to 10 years. Whereas if you're infected with HIV-2, it tends to integrate into your chromosomal DNA for quite a longer period, 10, 15, 20 years, even without treatment. And most importantly, since the HIV-2 has evolved from Mangabe's monkeys in Western Africa, we thought that the number of patients infected is quite limited. Let's say about one to two million, according to the roughest estimates that we know. While HIV-1 went on to cause AIDS, a pandemic panic has occurred. We know that there are about 37 million people infected with HIV-1, out of which only two million people have HIV-2 infection. So most of the scientists were focusing on HIV-1 under the spotlight. They were finding new drugs. They were designing new drugs. They were actually studying the replication cycle of the virus and trying to find each and every way to stop this devastating pandemic that we know. And while doing so, being humans and focusing on the larger picture, we let HIV-2 slowly slip from under our radar into oblivion. And that's why we call it the forgotten virus. We don't really know much about that virus. The life cycle or the treatment options for retroviruses is quite simple. Forget this gibberish and technical jargon. OK, it's not a microbiology class. I'm going to simplify it. You can either block the integration between the virus and the cell, so you essentially block the entry of the virus using the fusion inhibitors. You can inhibit a very important step in the retroviral cycle, which is the reverse transcription. Now, the retroviruses are extremely intelligent group of viruses. Why? Because they have RNA instead of DNA as their genetic material. So to be able to integrate into our own cellular DNA genome, they have to be transcribed. They have to change the RNA into DNA. So if you block this step, then there's not going to be any more DNA. There is no integration. Another option is to use integrase inhibitors when you inhibit the enzyme that will mediate the viral DNA integration into our DNA. And the last option, and my area of expertise, is when you use maturation inhibitors. Maturation is a very important step in the viral life cycle, which will process the viral protein into more mature forms. The virus structures become more organized and can infect other cells. So if you block this step, you will have what we call immature variants, which means that they're incapable of causing infection, and they simply die out. To make it simpler for you to understand how an anti-HIV drug would work, I've chosen one of the enzymes that causes the maturation of the virus. It's called the viral protease. This helmet 
cool looking structure is actually the viral enzyme itself. This is how it looks like. And if we imagine that this is the viral premature proteins, and this is where I've exerted all my artistic abilities. It took me two hours to prepare this demonstration for you, so please bear with me. The enzyme is going to bite to these proteins, and it's going to process them to more mature form. And the virus is going to be more structured and able to infect more and more cells. Now, when you use a drug to inhibit this enzyme, the drug is going to bind to the active site of the enzyme which means that the premature viral proteins are not able anymore to bind to the viral enzyme. So what is the problem, you may ask? The problem results because retroviruses are intelligent viruses. And each time there's a reverse transcription of the viral genome, new mutations happen. Actually, at least five mutations occur at each and every replication cycle. Each cell is able to produce 100,000 variants. Calculate, you do the math. So these mutations will happen in sites where the inhibitor actually binds. And this will lead to the inhibitor weakly interacting with the viral enzyme up to a point where it can no longer hold its place, inhibiting the, mature, the viral processing of the proteins, and the virus is going to continue on processing those proteins, even though they still have these mutations. And that's, why, well, that's what we really call the viral fitness, adaptive fitness. We know for sure that there's a 40 to 60 percent difference in the genetic sequence between the two viruses. As an example, I brought here the viral protease, okay, the one that matures the enzyme, the viral proteins. We know now that this, since there's a big genetic sequence between the two viruses, some amino acids, which are of course the building blocks of proteins, are actually present in HIV-2 that are associated with those treatment mutations that I showed you in the previous slide. So anyone in their right mind would know that, okay, we have to question whether the drugs used to treat HIV-1 can actually block HIV-2. And this is what we were set out to do. We've analyzed the drugs. Bear in mind that these drugs have been designed with HIV-1. They've never been tested on HIV-2. And to our surprise, we found out that almost 50% of the drugs that we use to treat HIV-2-infected patients are actually have lower efficacy. They are much, much weaker than the other drugs. So this brings into question uh, the type of methods that we use. Clinical centers where AIDS is pandemic do not differentiate between HIV-1 and HIV-2 infections. It's simple. Patient has AIDS, give them the standard drugs that we know. Nobody tests them, okay? So it is extremely important, and I feel that this is a bit late that we're only realizing this now, that 50% of the drugs we use in HIV-infected patients are not as effective as the others. And the biggest problem is that while we have been busy with HIV-1, and we thought, what is 2 million compared to 37 million infected by HIV-1, HIV-2 has been spreading well beyond the geographical confines of Western Africa with recent statistics showing that the incidence of HIV-2 infection has spread all the way to Europe, especially in Portugal and Spain, and also France for that matter, is also spread as far as India and Asia, even Japan and Latin American area. And the incidence, I can guarantee you, is increasing. It's much more than the two million that they actually believe. At least four to five million HIV-2 infected. So we need to exactly characterize the drugs, we need to tailor the treatment for HIV to infected patients. One more interesting thing I'd like to share with you about HIV-2 is when I started working at the lab of Professor Joseph Tozer for uh, my PhD studies, I came across an article that was published in 1997. Now, in this article, it was a purely clinical article, and it showed that there are some patients who are actually infected by both viruses, okay? The interesting thing was that those patients who are infected with two viruses, HIV-1 and HIV-2, we call them the dual infection, actually did better than those who are infected with HIV-1. They lived longer, they didn't develop symptoms of AIDS, they were much better off with this dual infection. So cool, I thought, and I never gave it any more attention until one day I was reading this sentence by Shakespeare. I don't know why, because I never read usually, but I came across this fighting fire with fire phrase. And I thought to myself, okay, 
Let's try this. I was starting my work at the lab. I had cool pipettes. I had access to very expensive, cool instruments. And frankly, you put a clinician in a lab full of toys. What do you expect him to do? Naturally, expect him to start playing. And that's what I did. I tried to infect both cells with viruses at the same time and see what happens. And during that time, I had a really, really passionate, enthusiastic student who was ready to play along. And so when we carried out our experiment, we showed that the dual infection, when it infects cells with two viruses at the same time, has decreased the HIV-1's infectivity by 67%. And so cool, I thought. This is turning into one serious game we're playing here. So moving on, I thought, what's going to happen if we do this super infection, where we infect the cells first with HIV-2 and then HIV-1? And to our surprise, this has decreased the infectivity of HIV-1 to almost complete obliteration of HIV-1 infection. Now, things were getting serious. I was ecstatic. We were really happy. And I even did the victory dance, I remember, in the lab. I was that happy. And now we thought we were starting to play catch up with the virus. We are playing hide and seek. We are trying to find what is it in HIV-2 that causes this decrease in infectivity of HIV-1. And the question was simple. The answer was not. We were trying to dissect each and every single element of the virus to find out what was responsible. Until a couple of months ago, we were quite positive that we had identified the factor that was responsible for this decrease in infectivity. So the message I want you all to take home with you today, or tonight, is that it was our wrong assumptions about that the drugs used for HIV-1 can cure HIV-2 infected patients that have led to an increase in the HIV-2 incidence. If we continue these practices, I'm pretty sure we're going to have an epidemic that's as dangerous as the one that was caused by HIV-1. Of course, the dual infectivity, it's the preliminary results that we're reaching now, but we're quite positive that this might hold the key. The designing the drugs to treat HIV and AIDS, for that matter, is quite a generic form. You in design inhibitors that bind to the enzyme until mutations happen. So this could be fighting a losing battle with the viral uh, enzymes and proteins. So could this hold the answer to treating AIDS? I really, really hope so. Of course, we have to carry on more experiments, and I'll be happy to let you know as soon as we reach the conclusive results. And finally, the brightest mind of our time once said that he doesn't have any special talent. He's only simply curious. Of course, that was Albert Einstein. I've had this idea when I was laying on my couch reading Shakespeare. I've never had any training in a lab or molecular biology for that matter. I simply had an idea, and I tried to pursue it. So my message to you is that if you have an idea or an impulse Please follow it, a productive impulse, that is. You might never know what it's going to lead you into. Of course, you will not get that far without the help of a dedicated team with people who can help you all the time, students who are enthusiastic, and of course, a supervisor who would hold your hand and, of course, sign your monthly checks. Thank you very much for your attention.